Welcome. Nice to see everybody here. I'm Kathy Chuth, the Executive Director of the Institute for Applied Computational Science, and we're delighted to kick off the semester, this is the first study card day today at Harvard, uh, with a mini symposium um, organized by our fellow, our Institute fellow, Alex Wisner gross Great to have him here. But before we get started, I want to remind you, this is a regular series on Friday afternoons. We have uh, a series of lectures and talks. Uh, we'll have one next week and then later on in the month. Um, some very interesting things coming up. Take a look, take a peek. Um, and usually a combination of scientific and academic talks along with industry talks all around the issues of applied computational science. So no further ado, thank you very much, Alex, for organizing today's mini symposium, and we'll get started. Okay, let's turn to you. Thanks so much, Kathy. Can everyone hear me? Great. So uh, delighted to, uh, to kick off our fourth annual computational science ventures event. Uh, we have a, a very exciting uh, lineup this year. I'm very honored to have our speakers with us. Uh, the theme this year, uh, realizing the potential of cyber physical systems and Internet of Things, uh, I think touches uh, all of us in a variety of ways. And we're going to be hear some, hearing some, uh, I think, rather inspirational stories uh, from uh, entrepreneurs, scientists, engineers uh, who've tackled these problems head on uh, and will be sharing their stories with us. Um, so here's our, our lineup for the day. Uh, without uh, taking up any more time, um, I'd like to introduce Colin Engel. Uh, Colin Engel, uh, an MIT alum, uh, is the CEO uh, and co-founder of iRobot, the world's robotics company. And they've sold uh, more than 12 million robots total. So please join me in thanking uh, Colin for coming. Um, certainly not that many, so this is a, a new audience for me and excited to be here. Um, what I wanted to do today <clears throat> is talk a little bit about iRobot's story, uh, lessons learned, how we got to where we uh, have gotten, and also in keeping with the theme of the Internet of Things, speak a little bit about where we're going and how this uh, marvelous technological um, phenomenon is impacting our thinking. So uh, start with a question. Uh, here's uh, a bunch of things, Art Technology Group, Bluefin Robotics, Rock Band, Terrafuga, the MIT Blackjack team. Uh, just to get yourself thinking, what do all of these have in common? Any thoughts or theories? Boston. All from Boston? True. <laughs> I would say, I'll go one step further and say they're all from one fraternity at MIT <laughs> called Alpha Delta Phi. <clears throat> Here is us, this is how we MIT people have parties. They have, we have chemical spills and things like this. And the, the, um, when we think about entrepreneurship, and one of the reasons why these symposiums are so important to get people together, it's because entrepreneurship breeds entrepreneurship. And the point of this particular picture is that I was at this party, and if this guy could create a multi-billion dollar company, well, why the heck couldn't I? And it really is as simple as that. If you watch your peers, that you know their faults, their foibles, you see what they can do, and you say, they're not some kind of magical beast. They can do things, so can I. It does give confidence to taking on and embarking on this wonderful 
trip, which is entrepreneurship. And so my particular journey has to do with robots. So it started with a dream, my case a robot dream, um, to <coughs> build robots. And it wasn't these robots that inspired me. You'll sort of figure out as I go on that I'm not, I'm a little bit off in my view of technology. I was not like many people who felt that these were the inspiring robots of the movie Star Wars. Uh, no, in fact, it was this robot. Anyone recognize this robot? All right. What? R2-D2? No. Nope. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. I mean, um, the Death Star. The yes, Star. yes. The, uh, it was the Death Star, right? The Death Star was new. There was like all these new employees. It was fast, it was fast, but it was new. And they had all these new employees on the Death Star <laughs> who had no idea what to do. And the rebels were attacking and they needed to figure out how to get the turbo laser to defend themselves against this onslaught of, of, of unprovoked force. And <clears throat> this robot, if you remember, was on the Death Star and its job was to lead the stormtroopers down the corridors to the turbo lasers to shoot down the Rebel Alliance and preserve the Empire. <clears throat> and the reason why this was cool to me is because I saw it and I said, wait a minute. We could build that. We can't build R2-D2 or C-3PO, but you know, when I go to Home Depot looking for a left-handed smoke shifter, wouldn't it be cool if I had one of these robots to guide me to where I wanted to go? And that was the inspiration, this idea that we are faced in a world with real world problems that are not new. They just need new solutions. We have growing problems, the increasing numbers or percentage of our population being elderly and needing care, not being able to uh, figure out ways of paying for that care ways, threats that the global, uh, the world is under, which are increasingly challenging to clean up after. These are real problems, and for these problems and many others, there is simply a better way than the way we are currently attacking these problems. And this idea led to iRobot, <coughs> which is uh, we did about $556 million of revenue last year. We've sold over $2.5 billion of practical robots. That's weird. And there we go. And we were founded with this radical idea that we could take this technology and turn it into products that people would buy and um, solve some of these real challenges. Our mission <coughs> violates most definitions of what missions should be. <coughs> if you read the book that talks about a mission, this isn't it. It goes like this, build cool stuff, deliver a great product, have fun, make money, and change the world. It is inspiring though. We've had many people come to iRobot because they saw a company that stood for these things and said, wait a minute, I want to be part of that. And so it has been a very important part of our legacy. And the remarkable thing about it is you get people together with these radical ideas that they want to change the world and you can. So, our first business plan, I talk about practicality, and so you, you're thinking about everything I said before, and, and, and uh, so what was iRobot's founding business model, which was so practical that it just was boring, salt of the earth stuff that somehow made us successful? Well. To tell you the truth, our first business model was a private mission to the moon and we were going to sell the movie rights. Well, maybe not entirely practical, but we had a very practical attitude. Prior to the work that we did, this was how JPL was going to 
explore Mars with a robot about the size of a Humvee. It weighed 2,000 kilograms, and it moved about half a centimeter per minute. Uh, this didn't make any sense to me or my business partners because there didn't exist a rocket that could get a 2,000 pound rover to another planet. <coughs> so we did something else. We looked to insects for inspiration because JPL said, Yo, gee, you need to be that size in order to get over the obstacles. And so, well, you know, ants do pretty well. Insects do pretty well. They're not the size of a Humvee. They can climb over things. Could we build a small, tiny robot that could do this? Which led to one of the first insights I had in entrepreneurship, which was, if you're going to work on a really hard problem, make sure it's a problem where if you win, you win. What's the point of spending your energy and time on a, on a problem where even if you succeed, you haven't accomplished your goals? And so we took on this idea of could we make a micro rover that was capable of climbing over large obstacles, capable of being soft landed on another planet? Because if we could, well, we would have just enabled space exploration in a way that couldn't have been done before. <clears throat> and guess what we did? We created this small robot called Grendel. You're ready for flight. That's Cable a brilliant pebble. Here, I can do it. Launch control. We're at T minus 39 seconds and counting. Turn that down a little bit. So that was a brilliant pebble that we repurposed from the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization. We took out the, new, the uh, ICBM seeking uh, element, replaced it with our robot as at the end of a 14-hour countdown out at Edwards Air Force Base back in the early, early 90s. You can see it launches, translates over and lands. Everything else is coasting. And you can see we uh, touches down, ejects the carbon fiber cocoon. And we showed that you could create something very tiny, very small that was soft landed and enable robots to be used in a different way than previously thought about. Um, what happened next was NASA found out about what we were doing because the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization is not part of NASA or JPL. They complained that in fact they had the mission to go do this. So they shut down our project, took it over, and what was the Measure Pathfinder mission became the Measure Pathfinder Sojourner mission. And some of, much of the technology that we had developed um, <coughs> was incorporated into this marvelous and fantastic machine that went to Mars. And um, uh, Spirit and Opportunity followed. And uh, uh, my name's up on this robot as a result. And it's cool. Yes, please, what, ask questions as I go, because it's fun. Do you have uh, a payload measurement? So we had a, um, the ability to actually, uh, on the body of the robot, there was a scoop so that we could uh, walk to a location, put our chest on that location, and take a sample, and then bring it back. Yeah. How much, what was the travel, in other words, how much energy did you have, and how far could it walk? With the, the so that, that, that particular prototype could not recharge. That would be something that obviously would be an important part of a full solution. That robot could operate maybe for eight hours on, on uh, its lithium ion batteries. Sir. How hard is walking? Do the six legs work independently? Do they have some coordinated strategy? Do they feel the ground? They yeah. absolutely do feel the ground. They do have, uh, this is interesting, it gets into um, some of the technology that we had to develop to make this possible, uh, <clears throat> where part of the insect um, inspiration included creating a insect brain that could allow, with very small computation, very sophisticated motion. At that, before this robot and its predecessor, also built at iRobot, 
a walking robot used supercomputing style um, uh, computational uh, processing power in order to model the terrain, figure out all of the joint trajectories. Um, this particular robot used an 8-bit microprocessor and 256 bytes of RAM in order to do it. And it, uh, each leg had behaviors about how much weight it should support, how to balance, and so forth, which all operated in parallel and allowed coordinated dexterous motion over rough terrain without falling down. On your own, or did you take some inspiration from actual studies of insects? Um, the inspiration for insects plus um, a very, very lightweight multiprocessing compu uh, computational architecture came together to create the end result. So my business partner, uh, Rodney Brooks, who is the director of CSAIL over at MIT, had invented this thing called the subsumption architecture. We're on this 8-bit this microprocessor with 250 bytes. He could run hundreds of very small processes to make it possible. And th where this work originated, um, it was, uh, we called our, we were the AI lab, the artificial insect lab over at MIT. Um, we were studying six-legged gates of insects and my, my uh, uh, master's thesis and undergraduate thesis was on insect local, locomotion. So there was a lot of that um, going into this particular project. So a little of both. But uh, um. <clears throat> the second thing that, that we took on um, had to do with mines in Afghanistan. The, um, uh, we were a little bit further in iRobot's history. The, um, uh, we were uh, sort of caught up as all of us were when the, um, uh, we saw the, uh, the bombing uh, in, in um, uh, New York and elsewhere on 9-11. And we sent soldiers over to Afghanistan. And then on the news, started seeing images of soldiers going into caves to go search for the Taliban. They, were, had, they had ropes tied around their waist so that if they were shot or killed going into these caves, they could be dragged back. And we thought this was crazy. This is just, come on. It, it, don't we have anything better? And, and we had been working on some robot prototypes that uh, were able, they were small, they're tracked, they were able to go into these types of environments. And so we went down to Washington. We uh, petition to allow our robots to be sent over to Afghanistan. We were rebuffed. We went back. We were rebuffed. We went back. We were rebuffed. We went back. Eventually, we found the rapid equipping force who said, well, if you had an employee who went through basic training, we could do this. So we found one of our guys who volunteered to go through basic training. We sent him to Bagram Air Force Base. Uh, that's the robot we sent with him. It was quite interesting. We showed up. The 101st Airborne was there. They said, oh my god, this is awesome. Where have you been? But we're shipping out to Iraq tomorrow, so the 82nd is coming in. You'll have to demo to them. So that said, OK, well, this is so far kind of cool. The 82nd came. We demoed to them. And they said, you know, we've been trained to clear caves. Uh, you know, just. Maybe we'll find something for you, 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 you guys to do eventually. Um, poor Tom was there. He wasn't going anywhere, so we, we patiently waited. Uh, and the next day, Sergeant Petrie and his friend, if you imagine, um, they were up at a cave mouth, and the following situation happened. Do you want to go in? <laughs> no. <laughs> do you want to go in? <laughs> Hey, let's call the robot guys. And so that cave mouth epiphany led to them embracing giving the robot to try, which they did, which was wonderful. And we formed a wonderful partnership with the 82nd. We went in and searched caves and found a lot of very, very scary, scary stuff and hopefully saved many lives. So this is, a, uh, in fact, inside a weapons cache in a tunnel in Afghanistan. You can see all the unstable C4 and AK-47 rounds that the robot, in fact, found. Um, <clears throat> probably the most dramatic way of telling this story is by showing it. Um, 
This is, we were later um, redeployed into Afghanistan, I'm sorry, into Iraq. We've sold 6,000 of these robots since that time. But here's a little bit, uh, here's two short video clips, both from uh, um, Baghdad. They decide to push it off the convoy route with an up-armored Humvee when it happens. So luckily that was an up-armored Humvee. The driver did survive that um, uh, event, but contrast it with this video. There's the OD's oh. robot going towards the uh, IED. That's the T-1000. Oh, Whoa, there goes their robot. <laughs> I, I got it. I got that on video. Poor robot. <laughs> so, kind of, kind of a difference. So that that makes makes me feel good. And and the I wrote the um, <clears throat> over the years uh, we have been honored and, um, and lucky enough to be involved in a number of different things, but it has been a journey, and entrepreneurship is not a pretty journey, it's, it's sort of like one of these ugly journeys, that's my ugly journey picture, just in case you're wondering what it was, I'd like to make it clear. Uh, if you graphed iRobot's revenue um, versus time, this is their first 20 years, <laughs> no. Because no, like, we can't see close to zero. Right. right. So we, we, we went like seven years before we got a pixel of revenue. <laughs> the uh, log plot would be make us feel better, but would not appropriately reflect reality. But uh, it, would, it would help, you know, anemic, you know, we made 100K in 1993. Uh, we could feel better. But if you had to go look at iRobot in one slide, this would be the slide. Well, how much of this, it seems like government contracts played a pretty important role between NASA and the military, right? Government yeah. contracts played a role here. Okay. So government contracts so maybe allowed some subsidence here, but what really what it did was teach us what to charge. Because we were, we had government contracts, but it was really small stuff. It's much, it's actually a much better environment. You can get real money from the government uh, these days. Uh, an SBIR contract back in these days, was like 10, 20K, it was, it was really small stuff. But in order to apply for one, you needed a real accounting system in place. And so that the best thing that the military and the DOD and um, government sponsorship did for us in these early days was forcing us to be realistic about how much doing engineering cost us and putting that, that uh, um, discipline into place, sir. So from 1990 to 1998, what did you live on? <laughs> well, they, um, <coughs> we did a lot of stuff. They, um, so we would go and, and work with research labs around the world. We would sell robots. That was my, undergra my uh, graduate thesis, which we then turned into a product. We would get paid half up front. We would build the robot and collect the other half of the money and then do the next one. So we were surviving hand to mouth. We had no venture funding until year seven because we were completely unfundable. Here's another robot that we um, we built and sold to different universities, so we did that. That robot was particularly good at entertaining small children, um, <laughs> which, given its cost, isn't a great business model. This is a, uh, a robot that was designed to uh, look for mines in shallow water. So it's a walking block of C4 that would bury itself if it kicked a, mo kicked a metal or, or um, uh, plastic object. So that was cool. We worked on robot fish. We discovered that the flapping motion of a fish is five times as efficient as a propeller. The, uh, so you can make incredibly efficient uh, um, swimming things. That's not a robot, that's the robot. <laughs> By <coughs> 
creating fish things. This is a robot that, that gave a tour down at the Smithsonian Natural History Museum and um, uh, <coughs> gave tours to hundreds if not thousands of kids. So we did all this stuff and nothing, of course, came of it. <laughs> revenue down at the sub-pixel level. But we were undeterred and we kept going. Um, this is one of the early prototypes of that robot we sent to Afghanistan ultimately. We had a small government contract to do that. That's a wonderful story, which I won't have time to tell. Um, the, uh, but you can see it's starting to do things that robots at the time aren't supposed to be able to do. Be thrown off buildings, climb stairs, and, and go through water. This was um, supposed to be research lab stuff. And so this was very important as we began to show that we could build robots to work in real environments. We worked with Baker Hughes and Halliburton making a uh, 40 foot long robot that went uh, miles underground into uh, oil wells and uh, did things. We built uh, robot toys for, for Hasbro and um, probably the homeliest looking baby doll ever <laughs> brought to market by, by a large firm. They, um, we built a robot velociraptor. What? So we did all that stuff and nothing came of it directly. In fact, the um, <coughs> iRobot entered and exited well over 14 different business models. This is a kind slide. It was probably up over 20, 25. Um, and yet we persevered. Um, oftentimes people look at, at your failures and say it could be your purpose in life is to serve as a warning to others. But the, I believe that a big part of being an entrepreneur has to do with risk management. Oftentimes entrepreneurs are accused of being these great risk takers. There's me, upside down, 600 feet in the air on my day six of the IPO roadshow. Um, and you could say, well, there you go. There's Colin being a risk taker. No, there's nothing risky about that at all because there's a rope. <laughs> I fell, I fell about three feet and they lowered me down and I tried again. The key to entrepreneurship and succeeding is understanding risk management, not risk taking. iRobot, if nothing else, serves as an example of how runway and persistence can ultimately lead to success as you figure things out over time. We raised money when things were good, we used money when things were bad, and we got ourselves enough time, years, to figure it out and take off. Because it can all work. The, um, <clears throat> uh, the next story I will tell uh, is about probably our most famous product, Roomba, and <clears throat> how it came about. We sell, last year we, we sold almost half a billion dollars of these robots. Crazy, it's like, a, wow, <laughs> that's a lot of robots. <laughs> so in the beginning, there was Rosie and the Jetsons. It was 1962 and we all knew what robots were going to do for us. Then there was, there was much rejoicing and 28 years passed and the best really we could do, uh, well the world became skeptical, is my clip art for skeptical. It's available online if you want skeptical, embodied in face. <laughs> but here he is. Beautiful. Skepticism. 20 years passed, iRobot was founded, and we knew that cleaning was a great application. Why? Because everybody told us. I would introduce myself, hello, I'm Colin Angle, CEO of iRobot, and before they would say, good to meet you, Colin, they would say, when are you going to clean my floors? For real. It was like, a little weird, I would bet people that they were going to say this to me, and they would. But uh, we knew it was a good application, but we didn't know how to clean. We didn't know how to manufacture. We were completely unfundable, 
and had no money. The, um, uh, <laughs> six years passed, and we did all this stuff that didn't work. But we did learn about partnering with other companies. We developed this thing I call the asymmetric strategic partnership. Uh, the way it goes, you have a big company that's got lots of money but doesn't consider itself to be innovative and is looking for future growth opportunities. You're the small company, you think you're cool, have cool technology and are very innovative because really that's all you got, and, but you can play it up very well. And so that you go to the big company and you say, hey, how about we partner and create something exciting and new? The interesting parts of this relationship was that in addition to saying, let's partner, I would also say, and I will make no money. You need to cover my cost, and I'm a government contractor, I've got government rates, I know exactly how much my costs are, I go to jail if I lie, but I will make no money. And you <coughs> will pay me because I'm also going to give you the right to cancel this relationship at any time with no penalties. If you don't like the way we're working, just cancel it. And uh, because you have this right, just cover my costs and we'll have a partnership. It works great. I've done it six times. It's great for a couple reasons. For the big company, you're cheaper than their own IRAD. By a lot. You're also outside of their culture and so that you can do some things that they could never do internal to their organization. So it's actually pretty, uh, a pretty good deal for the large company. And there's no entanglements because they can actually sever the relationship whenever they want. And for you, you get paid. And because you're not making any money, you can make a legitimate claim to divide the value that gets created out of this partnership. And it works. And we did this with Johnson Wax. We built a cleaning robot with, with Johnson Wax. <clears throat> I think even at the end of the project, when it was ultimately not successfully commercialized for lots of completely different story, could have been, but they were very happy with the partnership. What happened to iRobot? Well, we learned how to clean. <laughs> we had patented technology on how to clean. We worked with Hasbro. We made this, this, this egregious baby doll, which is uh, very cool, not very pretty. We made this Velociraptor you saw in the video, which actually did become a successful product for Hasbro later on. Didn't work out long term. We were in this partnership about three and a half years. We're not in the partnership with Hasbro, but we learned how to manufacture. So now we had a company that knew robotics, knew coverage. I didn't mention this. We, we learned the algorithms on your Roomba, if you have one, cover the floor very effectively because they were developed as part of our mine hunting program. So we have DOD mine hunting technology in Roomba ensuring that it gets everywhere in your home. So we knew about coverage. We learned cleaning from, from uh, Johnson Wax. We learned mass manufacturing from Hasbro. It was 2000, so that there was way crazier stuff than iRobot getting funded. Thank you, uh, Internet Bubble, for making me fundable. So we had venture capital, and we came up with this great direct to consumer product named the Cyber Suck. <laughs> the Cyber Suck is, in fact, the best that we could do. We were in the en an engineer's engineering organization. In fact, there was, a, there was a strict policy. You were not allowed to say the word marketing without immediately saying weenie after it. There was, the, we were terrible. We, were, we just had no idea. We had this whole company-wide contest, what should we name our vacuuming robot, the cyber suck. And the, the, the wet version was going to be called the muck master. And um, so in a, a moment of clear-headedness, I decided that we would not, in fact, launch the Roomba called the, the, the Cyber Suck. Second place was the Dust Puppy, not very much better, although not vaguely pornographic, at least, the, um, and came up with the Roomba, and I actually had to pay probably the most difficult check ever 
in my life. It was a $16,000 check to catapult thinking to come up with the name Roomba because we failed clearly. And they helped us. And we learned a little bit about marketing. <coughs> we launched the Roomba in 2002. The first commercial for, for Roomba uh, was not made by us because we thought advertising was somehow crass. The world should just know. Um, it was done by our, our, our Korean partners. This is it. <laughs> we had smoke, we have explosions, we have women in leather. That was, I mean, that was. This, this was like, we were like, really? This, this, this validated all of our, our opinions about advertising. Uh, that, you know, but um, that was the first commercial for Roomba. Not proud. Have to work today just as a parent. Probably, yes. It's amazing. Um, but what we did write was the press. And this is this, is this wonderful weapon that, that young startups who are doing interesting things have in that uh, this list of, of Wall Street Journal, New York Times, all these wonderful, this is the people who wrote about Roomba in the first month after launch. And we sold 70,000 Roombas in the first, from September uh, 15th to the end of the year. Um, it, was, it was amazing. There was this moment when I got a call from Brookstone and, and uh, the buyer at Brookstone. So, hi Pam, how's it going? She's like, oh, it's going okay, Colin. It's like, so, so is Roomba doing okay? Oh yeah, it's doing okay. I have a question you know, about getting some more. It's like, oh, you want more? How many more do you want? How many more can you build? <laughs> and they paid to have them air freighted in from the Far East, which never happens. And that was sort of the moment when we realized that this was gonna be a good thing. Um, almost died the next year. Um, the, uh, <coughs> I think this is the right one. The, um, what happened the next year is we, we thought we were God's gift to whatever. We brought in 300,000 Roombas to sell. It is now after Black Friday, after Cyber Monday, uh, probably Wednesday of that week, and we still had 250,000 Roombas because we didn't really uh, have it, this whole marketing thing figured out yet. And uh, we had a meeting in the morning. Uh, it was an all-hands stand-up every day, and, and the guy running internet sales raised his hand and said, well, well, why did sales triple yesterday? And we said, well, I don't know. We didn't do anything. We didn't know no article, no, no advertising. Um, but there was this oh, television you commercial. In a Take your time. That, don't you? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thirsty now, ain't you? It's what you want, ain't it? <laughs> little Pepsi. Mmm. <laughs> ah! oh, <man. laughs> Your vacuum cleaner ain't no pants. There's nothing I could do. Chips like and Pepsi. sales tripled. It's the cold. And we sold 250,000 Roombas between that day and the end of the year. The, we learned that, uh, in fact, <coughs> telling your story, because we actually had done a commercial. It was a picture, it was a commercial of Roomba um, earlier in the year, just driving down the floor, picking stuff up. But it was so foreign, no one could relate to it. It was sort of a geek ad for geeks, and geeks bought Roomba, but there aren't enough of them. The, uh, uh, this showed humor, it showed efficacy, it had a credible Dave Chappelle icon, calling it a vacuum. It was a very human commercial, showing how a robot was just part of this woman's life, cleaning stuff up. It was, it was incredibly powerful, incredibly credible, and it certainly changed how we thought about advertising. And <clears throat> 12 million Roombas later, we have now 
disrupted the vacuuming category. In fact, we now capture about 18% of all dollars spent on vacuums. We're the number one selling vacuum cleaner in Spain. We are the top, uh, top five most everywhere else, top three most markets. And uh, even recently, the, uh, the, the president of Dyson has said the future of vacuuming is a hand vac and a robot. Upright vacuuming is, is basically dead if you still have an upright vacuum cleaner. Sorry. <laughs> you, you, are, you are now behind the curve. But the, the robots are at a point where they can do an effective, such an effective job uh, that upright vacuum cleaners are on par now with robots. But the robot could come out every single day and go under your beds, under their couches, and then you do need something for stairs and couches and things like that. But that represents the future. And so it's, um, <clears throat> again, you can have an idea, you can have a wonderful journey, and the world can, in fact, change as a result. Can I ask a question? Sure. How much do you worry about the competitive landscape of, of robotic vacuums? I, I mean, it's you go to a store, we have about, 65 to 70% market share. So of that 18%, it's that percentage is, is, is ours. Um, <coughs> I think that we as a first mover were able to create a global brand. And we were also able to innovate and f keep focused on, you know, learn from our semi-humorous, grievous errors of the past and make sure we our messaging is on point about efficacy, about making people's lives easier with our technology uh, or with our robots, not focusing on intimidating technology. And I've been able to maintain it, in fact, watch our share grow in the past couple of years slightly, which given that the industry is growing at 20 plus percent is, is, is kind of cool. Um, but every day is a battle. I mean, Dyson's announced they're going to come out with a robot, the, the Panasonic. There's, do, there's, in any given year, there's dozens of competitors out there. And we have to aggressively obsolete ourselves, uh, come out with cleaning performance that is a leap ahead of where the competition is, and have the right product. And we have enough brand strength to allow merit plus brand strength to win against uh, inferior products with more powerful brands thus far. But it's, it's, it's a battle. What do you do about the idea of sort of adding home security to cleaning? Do you sort of aggressively try to suppress that on the team and say, no, 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 we're just about cleaning? Or do you sort of entertain like adding another functionality? You know, I think that it's a great question. Um, focus is often the, uh, the right solution. Uh, I think that Anyone, any competitive product offering that has tried to bundle other stuff onto their vacuum cleaner has failed. There's an insight that when, if you, if you own Roomba, you name it, then you think it's a robot and it's cool. If you don't own Roomba and are asked, would you name your Roomba? You almost get a violent negative reaction because people buy, are making a serious decision about purchasing a vacuum cleaner to vacuum. They don't want it to talk to them. They don't think it's rosy. They, you know, it's, it's, maybe it's an easier vacuum. And so making sure you understand what's in your customer's head when they buy it is critically important. So putting cameras on so you can have a nanny cam on your vacuum cleaner, does that make sense? Do you, well, no. But a robot to do security at some point in the future will make a lot of sense. So. Uh, we are going through uncharted territory, and every time we get ahead of ourselves by thinking that we're building rosy as opposed to thinking that we're solving customer problems that are causing great pain, we have an issue. And so that I think that the, uh, in fact, when we launched the robot, we didn't call it a robot. Because when we ask the customers, is this a robot? No, no, that's not a robot. That's an automatic vacuum cleaner. So if you look at our first packaging, the only word robot on there was iRobot, the name of the company. It was the Roomba AutoVac. And then it became the Roomba 
robovac, and then the robotic vacuum, and then vacuuming robots, sort of as we gave ourselves permission. And the press did it. We didn't do it. The press had enough power to call what we were doing robot vacuuming, and they branded the category for us. We would never have had enough money to do that. And so, uh, and I still think it's a tenuous brand. I, you know, I think that most people aren't, hey, let's go get a robot. They're, uh, my vacuum just broke. What should I do? My problem is I need to get another vacuum. So it's a great question. I would love the answer to be, oh, yeah, because sort of as the robot company, we've got a lot of, lot more we could do if the customer is willing to pay for it. But it's going to be a slow, painful journey as to, to get acceptance of new stuff onto the robot. There's some other questions, sir? Quick question about competition. Like back when you guys were scratching and you guys were making walking robots, like how were you, how did you guys not get discouraged by competition? Like I don't know when Boston Dynamics came about, but I'm sure there was companies like right along there with you. Like when you had a bad day, how do you look at them and say, oh, we can't do this? Or how did you keep going with it? Well, the, the um, I'm not sure exactly about the statistics, but it is very common in winning entrepreneurial case studies to have a team. Why? Because the chances of everyone being mortally depressed on the same day is lower. <laughs> it's just the physics of, of the whole thing. And so, um, you know, those days happen. And, you know, the question is, will you be able to pull yourself up and keep going? That, that, that mission, build cool stuff, have fun, deliver great product, make money, change the world, um, I mean, that was real for us. We were having fun. We were, I mean, we may not have been making money for a long time, but we were on the cover of Scientific American. We were exploring planets. We were, we, we went into the, the Great Pyramid in Giza. We were doing all sorts of really interesting things and making enough money to take home a salary that uh, in the first 10 years, our attrition rate was 0.01%. Nobody left. You know, the, we, you know it, it took going public and having 600 people and, and, and a large organization before we started to have any appreciable tr attrition in, in our labor force. Uh, we're what is called a very mission-driven organization. People came to work to iRobot not necessarily to get the highest paycheck, but because they wanted <coughs> to be part of making the robot industry real. And with that mission, uh, you can work yourself through a lot, of, a lot of pain because you think the cause is noble, the cause is good. Sir? So you said in the first seven years you didn't get any venture funding. Nope. Was that by choice or? Nope. Okay. <laughs> I got turned down I don't know, 50, 60 times. That was, <clears throat> I was often, Friday afternoon entertainment at, at the various VC firms. Um, you know, it, it is, uh, um, we, <clears throat> again, the, one of the problems with a mission-driven company is especially what iRobot was, is that our revenue model and our business model were much less developed than our technology strategy and the fact that we were going to change the world, those, those were, were certainly, we overperformed there, but had difficult, a more difficult time saying, uh, and this is how we are going to get to profitability and, and so forth. One more. Did you run into any VCs who wanted to take over and <coughs> buy you out? Uh, not, never buy us out. You know, I think that the, um, you know, a venture capitalist uh, has a, a, a world that they have to live in. There's, they have to go and defend their investments against their peers every Monday. They have to go raise money from their LPs who are expecting a return. And so they're understanding the motivation of your venture investor is, is critically important because they may seem like they're very aggressive and telling you all sorts of things you don't want to hear because they don't get your vision. But understanding their motivation and making sure the investors you bring in 
have enough runway if you're if you're a, a missionary company and you're you're getting funded out of year five of a seven year fund you're going to have an issue um, because there's no way you're going to provide an exit to that fund in two years or three years or, or maybe four years um, so we were very careful in who we brought in we we're also very lucky that uh, <coughs> the venture investors we did bring in shared some of the mission. And then thirdly, and probably most importantly, we never raised money when we needed it. And so that when things were good, I would say to my board, I think we should raise money now. And they would say, no, you don't need money. I said, well, okay. And then I would go and, and raise money anyway and then bring a term sheet to the board and say, why do you bring a term sheet board? Because we should raise money. Um, because you know, here's this great plan about how we're going to use it, and you have a fiduciary duty board to think of the company and whether this is a good thing for the company. And, uh, you know, that um, strategy worked because, you know, it is very common to get in a situation where you lose leverage and then you can lose control. Uh, so we avoided that happily. One and then two. How did you go about designing the Roomba robot? How did you make it friendly for people to use? I imagine you went through a number of prototypes, mm -hmm. probably rejected a number of them for, because people didn't like the way it looked or moved or something was off-putting. How did you settle on a design that you now have? Um, <coughs> Well, at that beginning, at the at the beginning, we had a um, our idea was that the robot should drag a Swiffer electrostatic cloth behind it, and not be a robot at all. Um, it should be round because if you're round, you can never drive into a a place that you cannot turn around in your own volume and leave. That's why it's round. Side brush, if you're round, you have to get corners, and so you need to extend into corners, and so you can't actually be round. You need a, a squishy something that can extend out beyond the, the uh, side of the robot and get into the corners in order to work. So you want something that's round but not really round in shape. Um, and so that we thought our way into that paradigm, and then we found out through customer testing that if it only dragged a electrostatic cloth, then customers would pay 50 bucks for it. But if it was a vacuum, they'd pay 200 bucks for it. And so um, you know, that gives you an idea that customers are giving you qualitative information, not quantitative information, but it's still valid. Um, and so uh, fairly about 80% into the development of the first Roomba, we had a crash program to add a vacuum. And so we only had a small amount of, of space left in the robot to, to actually house a vacuum. So it had to be a hyper-efficient vacuum, else we wouldn't have been able to do it. So we invented this idea of taking two pieces of rubber, pulling the vacuum through that narrow slit so you get high velocity air to pick up the fine dust and then pick up the big stuff with rollers in front of it. And so desperation in, drove that particular innovation, which has been something that has allowed Roomba to uh, be as effective as, as, as it has been. And then uh, we, we cycled, um, you know, that was, that was basically it. And our, our navigation, we didn't have enough money to put any real uh, sophisticated um, laser-based navigation or, or vision-based navigation and didn't exist at that price point. And so that we had to use a uh, heuristic strategy-based navigation, which, again, we borrowed from our mine hunting days. But it was a lot of engineer, hard engineering constraints. And then you asked an interesting thing, how did you make it look cute? Actually, we explicitly designed it not to look cute. We tried, because we wanted people to take it seriously. And so there's lots of ideas. In fact, there was a competitive um, program to make a vacuuming robot, which was all about making it look like a bunny. Um, and um, we rejected that. We said, we want this to be a, considered to be a serious appliance. People may naturally think it's a toy. We don't want it to be a toy. That's why we had metallic colors. That's why 
we actually tried to make it difficult to personify, although people do it anyway. And um, <coughs> that was a design intent as well to, to make it be taken seriously. Now, how long do I have before you, you, we, we go? All right. <laughs> okay. Apple computers, which I see where a lot of people have caught fire in the past. Did you deal with that as a safety issue from the battery? They, um, we, we certainly dealt with many different issues. Um, there was um, some situations where Roombas, early Roombas melted, um, issues where Roombas scratched floors and so forth, and, uh, and Roombas broke. In fact, one of our biggest challenges was we designed Roomba to the European standard for quality. The European standard for quality for a vacuum cleaner is 150 hours. It doesn't sound very long, but that's true. The problem is upright vacuum cleaners are used half an hour once a week, and Roombas were used an hour every day. So we were having, we were reaching our design lifetime based on how people were using the Roomba in about three to six months. And that was, that was horrible. But what we did was very aggressively gave replacement Roombas. People went through three, four Roombas before we came out with our next generation. And there's this interesting statistic which says, you will have better brand loyalty if someone has a problem and are treated well than if you never had a problem. And so we were able, by aggressively investing in customer support, build our brand and build our brand loyalty despite the fact that by design our, Roomba, our robots failed in three to six months. And raced like heck to, instead of adding features, add durability and lifetime to the, to the robots and uh, got them to last for a couple years fast enough. Oh, sorry. Uh, it's a fantastic story, but there's also kind of a survivor bias, right? Like you wouldn't be here if the company weren't <laughs> successful. And ex post facto, all these decisions that you talk about look like, oh, well, we made the hard choice and it turned out right, right? So I'm kind of curious, sort of speaking more broadly, like other companies that you know completely fail and they're not going to be here, right? Yeah. So I mean, how much? I, I don't mean to trivialize, like, oh, you just got lucky, but obviously there must have been certain things that were really, really important, and other things kind of came along uh, that maybe weren't quite so core. And I, just sort of in a broader picture, can you? sort of speak about this? Sure. I mean, I, I think that iRobot is an interesting uh, case because we were not an overnight success. We failed and failed and failed and uh, before finding our way. And so that I think that the, uh, the idea that <coughs> you say, well, what did we do most right was about First off, being a humble organization which was willing to pivot when things didn't look like they were going. It wasn't, hey, this, this wall, this brick wall is, 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 is feeling pretty hard. Maybe I'll run against it again. Um, we turned and we ended up with a, uh, a very rigorous, very honest assessment of many different possible things that we could do with our our technology, with our people, with our energy, and with our enthusiasm. Uh, this idea when things are good, give your, build runway. Because in, you, you're not succeeding until you're succeeding. And until then, you have no idea whether it's another month, another year, or another three years. And in our case, it was always another three years. Um, and so the survival instincts Yes, we are a survivor, but we're a survivor because we did a good job of being honest with ourselves about when, what our burn rate was, when that was going to run out, and uh, you know, <clears throat> what were we going to do about it. You see a lot of uh, startups where, you know, hey, I want to be rich and be an entrepreneur, so I'm going to go raise lots of money, I'm going to pay myself a lot, I'm going to go... Uh, it's a sexy job, so I should be in a sexy location, you know, and, and you get these brand new startups with burn rates which are insane. I mean, that's, it's one of my biggest frustrations with entrepreneurial uh, um, ventures, you know. When we started, everyone got paid 30K. Everybody. It was all the same. We started in my house. We moved into a concrete building. 
whose claim to fame was, our rent is so cheap, no one has ever failed while they were in, in that particular building. <laughs> You know, they all, they all got, got all, uh, too, felt too much of themselves and moved to high rent district and then failed. <laughs> the, um, I mean, entrepreneurship is a, is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And, and because, you know, I think I got very good advice when I was, uh, by one of my first board members, I put up this five-year financial plan where out in year five, I was still carrying the, the revenue and the profit figures out to two decimal places. And it was like, hey, Colin, what are you doing? I mean, you can't predict next week and you've got a five-year plan. You know, when you show me these things, they are, they're either lucky or wrong. Focus on the next six months. Focus on uh, with a concept as to how you're going to win longer term. But don't waste your time making multi-year P&Ls that suggest that you can predict things you can't predict. There may be business models where that's not the case, where you can, but for most of us, you want to understand what the if we win, we win is. You want to understand how to risk mitigate the ifs, and then you want to get on with it. In the, in the back, and then you, sir. Mentioned the value of partnering with larger companies. Yes. At this stage of your company's evolution, are you now interested in partnering with entrepreneurs who maybe just have an idea or a concept in mind? Uh, we have done so. So the answer would be yes. We're still a little smaller. You know, we're like the 50-pound gorilla of the robot industry. Um, we're not like a Johnson Wax or a Hasbro or a, um, a John Deere um, who are the best targets for this type of thing. But certainly uh, looking at uh, entrepreneurial uh, companies, uh, we, we, we've done it. And in fact, we just started a venture fund at iRobot to go invest in companies with relevant technology and relevant business models to, to even make it easier uh, to do it. And, and because sometimes uh, smaller companies are anxious to go get cozy up too close to a larger company, and a, a VC investment allows a, a simpler way of doing it. Yep, sir, and then in the back. Did you have to pay Asimov? Uh, or nope. Do you think it's we are great fans, and copyright law does not cross the, from books to robot companies. <laughs> Do you think that helped your uh, product recognition? Or the Almost, it almost did, because the, when the, the Will Smith iRobot movie came out, they almost bought the website from us, but, but we didn't. We, but we, I was, we got interviewed for the bonus CD, and we, um, put, we cleaned the red carpet at the, at the movie with, with Roombas, <laughs> and that was fun. Um, but um, certainly our partnership with uh, TV and movies have been... Uh, and, and the internet and, and YouTube have been important parts of brand building. There's 5,000 different videos of different life forms riding on Roombas <laughs> with hundreds of millions of views. It's, it, it is quite remarkable how that all, all ex became um, something. I'm not sure I'm going to get to the what's next. Five more minutes. All right. So the um, Internet of Things was, was what I told and promised Alex I would talk about. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, there's this phenomenon where more and more things are becoming co connected in the world. I'm not going to spend time hyping the, the hype. But it is giving us interesting new tools to go and, and find new ways of changing the world. And uh, one of the interesting things that we're working on has to do with travel. So the, um, maybe a traditional approach of how do I improve airline travel would be to build a cooler airplane. Um, but we've got all these new tools. We've got iPads. We've got connectivity. We've got um, wonderful things. And so instead of going down this, what I would, which I would call incremental improvement, why not remember what were the Internet of Things and invent teleporting. Wouldn't that be better? That would be better. We could, we could do teleporting. That would be better. So 
Uh, when you start thinking about how can you actually teleport, first you realize that the way they do it on Star Trek is a bad idea because you die every time you teleport. And a copy of you is reassembled somewhere else, but you're dead. So we're not going to do that because that, that sucks. Maybe the rest of the world thinks you're still alive, but right out. So why not <coughs> uh, get at the essence of teleportation? There's, here's a definition to simply directly transport a person across the distance instantaneously and try to build the definition as opposed to the Star Trek way and do it by building you. <coughs> if I could build a copy of you and it could be wherever you wanted it to be, and you could project yourself into that robot using connected technology, and your experience controlling that robot was so close to being there in person that it felt like you were there, then I would argue you have invented a more humane methodology of teleporting that would be a cool thing and the world ought to enjoy this new capability were it to exist. And so that's what we're trying to do. This is a robot called Ava. The, um, this idea that needs to be simple to use, needs to be direct, and it needs to be a good representation of yourself uh, is the mission. Uh, we have cool navigation technology as one of our tools, connectivity. Uh, and um, <coughs> uh, what we developed is an app on the iPad where you start it. You've got a list of, of places you want to go. You click on Bill's office, and, what ha and then uh, you wait a minute or two, and then you click go, and you're in Bill's office. How does it work? Well, the, um, if we're in Boston and Bill's office is here in Pasadena, <coughs> then actually this is built to go from Pasadena to Boston. So imagine I was in Pasadena. I'm going to Boston. And I selected, and that drop-down menu, Bedford, and then I selected Bill's office here. What I need to have happen is the robot drives from wherever it was recharging into Bill's office, and then uh, as soon as that's complete, I'm allowed to teleport there and control the robot in that office. You need an Uber deal. What? You need an Uber deal. An Uber deal, yeah. yeah. Maybe. I Uber. mean, you could have Uber delivering the robots that's to the I'm, building, and then... Yeah. to the place, that would work too. But, um, <clears throat> so we've created a system that does this, and then this robot uh, is trying to have a head that is comparably sized to this gentleman's head. It's trying to uh, have a skin and a body that is sleek, and you'd be happy with this thing representing you. We were doing some tests in a hospital where we, um, uh, had an earlier version of this robot without all the skin on it, and we were showing it to people, and they were like, oh, this robot moves too fast, and I don't like how close it gets to me. Uh, <laughs> and so we went back two weeks later and put the skin on the robot. Uh, same people. was like, oh, this is much better. It, it, it moves exactly at the right speed and is, is maintaining the appropriate social distance. And we hadn't done anything to the robot other than <laughs> put the covering on it. But... So this, this idea that it needs to look kind of sexy and, and, and um, uh, appropriate is important. And then uh, you can see this actually moves up and down because uh, being at the right height is critically important when you're attending a meeting. So if you're talking face to face, it should stand. If you're down a table, it should sit. And so we had to add that functionality, sir. Sure. Do you want to be a platform for others to develop on versus just having your own product? Uh, we're, we are, um, well, we are a platform, and we do have a partner who's developing a related product and has actually commercialized that product already. In fact, we're focused on this practical teleportation capability in factories and in business environments and business settings. Uh, our partner has taken our, our, our platform uh, and put a medical torso on it and actually has... Um, uses this robot, and it is FDA approved, to diagnose patients at a distance. So that if you have a stroke, and you, know, you have three hours from having the stroke to being diagnosed and, uh, and receiving an intervention, 
Uh, and if you can get within that golden three hours, your chance of fully recovering is wonderfully high. But the problem is, if you have a misdiagnosis, you have a clot because you have a stroke because of clotting, and you get a treatment that clots the blood further, then you have a problem. Or if you have a clot a stroke because you're bleeding and you get a blood thinner, then you could die so that the uh, specialist required to make that diagnosis is, is critically important. And so what's happening today is that central hospitals who have these neurologists are buying robots for local and rural hospitals. And uh, uh, we are in these, and the creating these networks of specialists today. And so that's actually happening, and that is done through partnership. Uh, so that if you've got ideas, we can talk. So anyways, I'm done. The, uh, my last slide is, is that my favorite metaphor for building a company is it's like uh, building a plane like you fly it. Well, sorry, well, you fly it, yes. And from the inside of the plane, of course, it looks like unchanging constant peril, but it's not. It's what winning looks like. Thank you. Uh, so I have one final question. Um, if people want to reach out to iRobot, uh, either mm -hmm. to develop software on your platform or to look for venture funding, is there an appropriate uh, contact point that they should have in mind? So they can, uh, Christiana can field them and then she can direct them to the right place. Does that work? Yes. Yeah. And so? Public, public relations at iRobot. Sure. Public race at iRobot.com. My email, I'm Colin at iRobot.com, which works too, except it goes into my spam filter, and I only <laughs> check it once every couple of weeks so that you can send it to Colin. I will get back to you, but not right away. But public relations is probably far swifter because then Christiana will tell me, hey, look at this. Outstanding. Well, thank you again for coming. Please right. join me in thanking Colin one more time. Thank you.